welcome. Thank you for attending. Hope you all had a great lunch. And there's also some fine looking swag down there. So I'm going to be talking a bit about real time scheduling fault simulation. So I'll skip the mostly the uh, couple of bits. So hi, I'm Ben. So I'm an experienced open source contributor, mainly working around Linux kernel and sort of board enable, enablement. I am a senior engineer at CodeFink, which is a open source consultancy based in Manchester, UK. And no, neither city or United. They can both get to hell. Um, so gonna go what gonna go what we are gonna go through today. Well, starting with a little brief history of Linux real time, and thank you, Dirk, for making my slides already out of date. Um, so we'll do a brief description of scheduling, um, go a little bit about why we would actually want to make things worse given how many people are working on making it better, uh, some methods for disruption, um, results, not really got any, unfortunately we'll talk about that in a bit, issues and future work. So the content in these slides is aimed for sort of more intermediate to advanced and we'll probably get more advanced as we go through the slides. Um, this is not intended to be complete. The scheduler is a big area and as noted to anybody in the keynote, we apparently have a new one. Thank you. Um, and before we get started, if anybody is going to play along at home, uh, some of this stuff may cause an unstable or unusable system. So do not use on anything you care about keeping always in production. Uh, I would recommend either a virtual machine or something spare to start with. Um, only issue is virtual machines tend to make scheduling even worse than it was in the first place. So we'll start with a now out of date short history of Linux real time. So it started back in 2622 days, which was around July 2007. And the aim of this patch series was to improve, obviously, the real time performance. So in the beginning, there were issues like lock contention. There was one single big kernel lock, obviously very good for ease of programming, not very good for actually being able to split things up. Um, it also included things like threading interrupts so that your interrupts could actually run in a context. You could monitor them and then even interrupt them. Uh, and then things also like improving timers and <coughs> other parts of the kernel which were spread across and needed to synchronize um, cores. The patch has been slowly shrinking. So mainline merge started around 5.15 in October 2021, I think. Um, just don't quote me on this because uh, I did it, got it off a wiki. Um, but apparently as now uh, alluded to this morning, it is pretty much now in a mainline kernel. If you go and download the latest kernel, your real-time performance, if you configure it right, is going to be pretty good. So, so I'd talk a little bit about the Linux process scheduling just as a start. So you have your normal process types, so your normal, other, and etc. These are just generally what your normal processes would do. They're nothing special. They have some basic priorities and they're scheduled uh, as the sort of bottom of the stack. There are two classes of real time, yep. uh, which is the round robin and FIFO. These are going to be your more important tasks or tasks that require very quick data processing. Um, this would be stuff like your video audio playback where you have data coming in, you really want to get it processed very quickly and out again. Um, so these processes are run generally event, process, data, done, and then they'll sleep. And then there's the one outlier, which is the deadline scheduler. Now this is more to do with process is that you need to do something on a regular time base for a set amount of time. And this is the one bit of the scheduler where you do actually get a guarantee that it should be schedulable, which can actually cause other problems because if you admit a deadline task to the kernel, 
the kernel is actually saying, yes, I have runtime to do this. Generally, the default configuration is 95% maximum, so at least you have some other time to do stuff, because there's nothing like not being able to log into a system. So, and then we have sort of the usual sources of interference. This is the sort of things that we're trying to minimize generally. So other processes, if you don't get your scheduling right or your priorities right, then you have problems. Um, you get roughly cases where, oh, I've only got a couple of real time threads on my system and you go and look at it. And then because things aren't showing as real time, the, the programmers are going, well, that's not real time. And it turns out you have 250 threads all competing for resources. I'm not going to talk too much about that. That's, your, that's problems that you can generally solve by just using top. Uh, interrupts. Hardware will happen. Other processes can end up running on your cores. Pain. There's a good amount of talks about how you mitigate that. We won't go into trying to undo things like CPU groups. Uh, kernel preemption locks. Again, we haven't got too much of those now. Hardware settings now. It's amazing how many problems can be found by the fact your hardware gets too hot, something happens externally. Um, this will be an interesting um, problem for people to actually reproduce. Um, so external events from like your system management, right? they can also be a, an absolute pain because they are the most important thing your BIOS thinks of if you're x86. ARM has something similar, I don't know about RISC-V, but there is architecture specific stuff here. So how are we going to aim to misbehave? So disrupt the proper scheduling of processes. That's going to be mostly to the end. Unexpected error returns. It's interesting. Very few people seem to actually properly check for errors. If you don't check for it, it doesn't exist. Uh, we can modify API call parameters. Um, I didn't get actually to do much of that. Um, and then we'll look at some ways of time variances. Um, as I say, this is all quite a big field. So this talk will go through some areas. There'll be some notes. Um, as I say, scheduling is a big um, task. So why would we do this? Now, as I say, testing, generally, error handling for starters. If you don't, if you say only check for the first error, which is an example we found when doing some load testing on a system. Stress NG, which is a very good tool for load testing, assumes that if your first deadline thread goes okay, nobody else is gonna fail. So if you limit its resources, which is quite a good way of testing, um, you end up with a whole pile of threads competing for your entire CPU instead of just some of it. Um, very much, we reported this, it's been fixed. So that was very interesting. That's one of the first things you can do is just limit your processes. Either put them into C groups, turn the kernel down. There's a number of settings. So we'll go, well, we started a little bit of how. Let's go into some more how. So we start with uh, user space and kernel. Then sorry, user space and then kernel. And we aim from going from the good, good tux on the left to a very bad tux on the right. You can tell he's evil, he's got the red eyes and the nasty little goatee. Yeah, I, I know how to draw. We'll go a little bit through the user space solutions. So we won't go into detail on these. Some of them I'll provide some examples. Others you can do for yourself. So you could wrap or preload around your code to say, okay, we call shed something, return an error, don't do it, modify the parameters. Lots of good examples on that. Um, there's also a user, say, user space probe. If you have that enabled in your kernel, you can probe in, do other things, cause these sort of same sort of errors. We'll skip that because it's very much generally the same sort of thing as K probes and we'll go into a bit of those later. Um, I say you can use, I actually found this interesting, you can use trace tools like strace to inject errors into processes. Um, and then, as I say earlier, modifying process limits. There's plenty of things you can play with. Um, 
please do not let me look at C groups again. So our first little example, we can use strace. So it can inject errors. Uh, so this example at the bottom, we say starting at the second call to shed yield, every fourth will fail. So if you're doing a deadline task, this is mo mostly where you'd probably look at your first error. Most scheduling does not need to yield like this. It's one of these special cases of deadline where you say, I've done my work and I yield specifically to get off the run queue. Um, this unfortunately doesn't work well with forks. S-trace can only really hit errors. Um, so it has some limited functionality, but it is generally going to be on your system. Uh, some of the issues we'll run into later require certain kernel options, which are generally not um, enabled in some systems. So you may end up having to build and run your own kernel, which is okay for testing, but you don't. Be, if you're trying to do this on something that's more uh, commodity, it can be a pain. So we'll go through um, some kernel things. As I say, some of the user space stuff will also come across in the kernel. So fault injection framework, that was the first looking, first thing I looked at. Um, it's fault injection. Uh, we'll go through that. Um, the eBPF system. So if anybody knows this uh, is a sort of loadable language that you can use generally good for like it was started with packet filters and things like that um, we'll talk some a bit about probing and the kernel patching well we'll talk about but i didn't actually get to do that yet so fault injection framework so this has been in the kernel since 4.16 however as taught, not every, well, certainly Debian does not ship this by default. Um, it's debug FS interface, so it's got a way you can configure it from users, user land. It has a number of filters like process ID. Um, the other issue is that it generally only runs to standard injection points, and there were not, there's not much in the way of actual scheduler. You can do system calls, but not. Um, schedule points uh, it attaches to a certain note functions so um, and I say unfortunately it's also globally configured so you can't really target sets of processes if you wanted to um, it really could do some additions to make it more useful so actual integration with the scheduler would be great um, and I couldn't get it to work so after configuring it and building my own kernel that was a little bit sad um, as I say, it would be interesting to look at making it longer, but sorry, making it more useful. But um, So next we'll look at the eBPF. So this has been in the kernel longer. 3.3.18, I think, was the first mention. Uh, it has been evolving since. It's a loadable code system, so you're basically like C, you compile it or use a tool. It loads into the kernel. Uh, it for usually used for kernel tracing, um, network monitoring, and there's a few other things now that use this. So there's a lot of, pro lot of projects, so it's more likely to at least have a base implementation in your kernel and distribution. So Debian has been shipping the tooling for at least two distributions. Um, so at least there's good, there's good tooling, and it has a lot of, excuse me, has a lot of mechanisms for sharing data with user space. So if you want to, you can get data out um, or modify some inf settings. Um, let's say it's more likely to be in a distribution. So, um, and actually one of the reasons why I chose this, we've been doing a lot of work with uh, safety, which is how some of this came about. And as part of that argument, we need to know that if you say we are going to schedule on this point, does everything work? Because if things aren't meeting their requirements, then you have an issue of your system. So, 
So BPF Trace is one of the tools that comes with generally with eBPF. It's a very simple, well, it's not very simple, it's a simple way of giving a command to BPF and having it load into the kernel and from the user space. The first issue I ran into with this is whilst you probably have the base configurations to use in this example the override function you need an actual kernel config because this is something that they think is rather unsafe and people wouldn't want to actually do. Now I can't think why that is. So in the BPF trace we say we have to say we're doing unsafe stuff here so we actually declare that we are absolutely fine with being unsafe. Um, we're attaching to the K probe called X8, well, this is X86 specific. So we say to the sys showed yield, uh, we have a filter on our process ID. So that's the PID equals equals. And then we go, we write some little code here, which is if our count gets above or equal to four, we set the count back to zero we return minus one from the system call because we override the path into the kernel and say um, no. So that's, a, that's another way of providing a similar sort of fault to our S trace. And then, however, we can now do something slightly more useful. So say we wanted to randomly stop something happening, we can uh, this example is pretty much the same as the previous, except we say, and I hope that my maths is right here, every eighth, well, randomly one in eight times, we'll return a minus one from the shared yield. Um, again, oh, it's, again, we're using kprobe. Uh, this time we've used a filter on the task name. So anything that's called simple deadline, which is a little utility I wrote to test this, will we'll end up with this error. Unfortunately, in this, it's difficult to actually probe the point where it's doing the yield because that's an internal function into the scheduler and I think it's, a, it's an inline static. So the K-probe interface, which is a way of attaching probes to pretty much any, well, most functions because some, and which we'll talk about later, are not probable, um, is very flexible, but also unfortunately adds a little bit of overhead so it may or may not be in your distribution again. So moving on we've done some error injection. So <clears throat> what we would really like to do is try and disturb the actual scheduling point so we say either come in early, come in late, maybe we also should look for a deadline of saying actually overrun because that's one of the special things about deadline again which really is its own little sub-project is that if you overrun on a deadline task it is meant to throttle you and under certain system loads it should either throttle you into the future as well or try and steal time from other people if it has it. Um, it's a, one of the annoyances in this because pretty much everything else is generic. You could actually apply some of these issues to non-real-time. Non Unfortunately, deadline just makes life just that more compli complicated. So. We're, we might be able to do some of these things from user space again. So we probably could inject wake-ups via signals or something like that. Um, and we could also add some delays into calls. Annoyingly though, for a deadline, you, can, you have just one point for, for most other systems, system, call, system scheduling. You could be sleeping on other system calls or something else or anyway. It soon realizes that this is probably more um, content than probably even this conference could deal with at some point. Um, so we said 
my initial thoughts were, well, we can inject delays. Um, we could do things like force moving processes to other um, cores if it had SMP, which would inject delays. Um, next thought was modifying the wake up and runtime, but that turns out not to be as quite as easy as thought. Um, given the complexity of the scheduler, well, let's try and avoid the internals because they change and we'll um, talk about that. And another thing we didn't really talk about is runtime parameter changing. Because that adds the extra headache of did I change it and then the process changed it and then do I need to change that back? So, oh, um, I mean to wish I'd gone into something easier like alligator wrestling. So, and this is getting into the sort of more deep parts of the kernel. Go and have a look at the, the kernel shed directory. And that code base is 57,000 lines or so in V610. Mm, lovely. Um, there's also the Arch Pacific code, which we're not going to touch. Uh, there's a lot of kconfig options uh, because you can change how it defaults. Um, oh, and new ones keep turning up. I don't know yet how the new scheduling is going to be working. So what's going to happen? Um, Although most code uses a single clock source, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. So, we talked about K probes as a way to attach. Um, could we use trace points? That is going to be a bit of a problem because it turns out that a lot of them are called under locks or in fast path code, so you probably don't want to be messing about them too much. Um, so it does starting to look a lot more likely you're going to have to sh patch into the scheduler. And we'll talk a bit. Um, so I mentioned trace points. If, nobody, if people don't know what those are, they are defined points in the kernel where you have tooling like BPF trace to attach. Um, they're generally, unfortunately, post decision making. So the kernel is telling you it has made a decision and you're going to like it. So if any uh, little below example there shows a trace point attached to the scheduler switch, which is saying we've switched process ID from a previous to a next. Um, do not try this on a loaded system. It produces an awful lot of output. Because of course, you're not just switching user land processes. There's also kernel threads, interrupt threads, and anything else it feels like. So, is this as far as eBPF can go? Well, yes, unfortunately, diving into this, because of its security, there's only a certain set of functions it's allowed to call, and there's a verifier to stop you doing anything stupid. It doesn't have delay or sleep calls, although that may not be very useful. Um, adding an actual proper function call into eBPF touched about seven or eight different kernel files. Um, although there is a way of unstable additions, that's probably not going to give us much more than we had anyway. So, so we move on K probe and C. Well, could we use that to prod? Mm. It's the interface we've already talked about with eBPF. C allows you to write a lot more unsafe stuff because you have access to everything that the kernel has. But unfortunately, we're still subject to issues with locking sleepable functions. The scheduler is generally called under a number of locks because you have a, diff a lot of different moving parts. You have each core, so each run queue is locked and then, and then, and it becomes an absolute headache of trying to actually work out what's going on. And um, we also now have to write our own filtering code because we've lost the ability to just write some very simple filters. So we'd have to have some way of configuring it. Maybe we could go back to the kernel function, uh, kernel fault injection. 
Oh, and the other problem is if you accidentally K-probe yourself, it doesn't recurse. But that probably isn't a problem for them. So, going into, and this is now the work in progress. So, um, what I didn't mention at the start, um, the project I was on has basically been sort of paused. So, they've got no current requ immediate requirement for injecting faults that they haven't already found, like actually running a whole pile of hardware. Um, and this was a late addition to the, the um, conference. So at least we have a fairly central point where decisions are made. So the schedule call in the, in the core, the schedule code in the core is the point where the kernel goes, do I do something new here? If if so, what do I do? If not, I'll go back to whatever I was. Mostly, if it's deciding that there is something new to do, it will call pick next task to fairly obviously find something new to run. So obviously, this must return a task. Uh, unfortunately, it isn't exported. It's internal, again, to the code. So we can't k-probe that, which is very annoying. Also, since it's internal, we can't then k-probe and then recall it because then we could have said, okay, you picked something we didn't like. We'll put that back onto the sleepable queue and then we'll go back and I try and do something else. So we, because we just can't return like null, um, it's also, uh, let's say, uh, as it, so that and that it's gonna be very difficult to override means that we're probably going to have to patch into the kernel, which is what we were trying to avoid in the first place. Um, and if you think, or well, I thought then, okay, maybe we could try altering the schedule clock to say, change the time for this task. But unfortunately, it also turns out that the kernel tends to cache this value in various places, which means you'd have to go in and change it for pretty much the entire either run queue schedule class which means that you're probably going to end up disrupting things you never actually intended. I mean, I'm all for chaos, but I like regionally, rigidly defined areas of chaos, to paraphrase a great prophet. So, and we have, of course, our shed deadline, which is our special case. Um, so thinking about how we disrupt this, we might be able to do some early wake up. So. We'll see if the task gets throttled um, and how it affects future periods. And we could also do some delayed wake up. Um, but again, this is gonna probably require altering the shed code. And this is something that I've been looking into but didn't get finished. Um, other schedule classes, well, hopefully we could do pretty much the same thing. Um, early wake up, well, that may not be quite as useful for them the um, some will be work waiting on timers but quite a lot will also be just blocked on waiting for some sort of data um, so you could signal them and see what happens but it's unlikely to be able to actually wake them up usefully although having early wake up and checking that they deal with no data might be might be actually something useful for people um, the late wake up now that would be fairly easier because you could just say to the call that's going to do the wake up. Okay, actually, I'm going to fake that you waked up. So I could take that out of the equation, set up a note, my own timer, and then say in X number of microseconds, come back and actually do the work. Um, that's unfortunately also just assuming it was sleeping because it may well be just a running process. So I'll go through some conclusions. Um, well, the easy stuff was very easy to do. There's a number of different ways you can cause just errors into the system. Uh, the whole scheduling thing is a lot harder than I thought when we started. As we said, the code base is fairly large and in some places quite complex because it's doing some fairly complex things. And there are just so many different paths I think currently we have either five or six scheduling classes 
which include things like deadline classes, own code. Um, so unfortunately, as I say said earlier, I'd have liked to have completed some more of this, so I'd have some better um, info and actually have run this on test farms. Um, and I think probably either extending the scheduler to have some sort of fault injection or at least patching in some points to allow better access to that sort of data, I think is going to be inevitable, which unfortunately ends up with a problem of evolving code and having to probably take out external code. So, I mean, future work where well, I'm hoping to spend some more time on this, uh, maybe finish a few of the harder tasks um, in the next few weeks. Uh, they may turn out to actually be either impossible or d maybe even more difficult than first thought, but hopefully this is a introduction to the ideas and that maybe people will carry on. Whether we can get this into the kernel, who knows, but we can have a try. Uh, so hopefully I'll be putting up uh, not only a link to these slides, but various bits of supporting material. Um, I've created the project but haven't uploaded anything. Uh, I hope the QR code works. I did that over lunch, so instead of queuing for sandwiches, I made nice QR codes. It's nice-ish. Um, and there's my email address for anybody who would like to add to my ever-growing list of emails. So, as I say, hopefully I'll get some code, simple examples uploaded, maybe some patches and a few things like that, and I'll write down examples. I have a number of other bits and pieces of scripting that will hopefully get make it into the documentation. So I'm going to put a few references. So there's some various things. The, I think the interesting thing when I was starting out is the uh, open source labs. They've been doing some very good testing and they have a whole pile of information about how things have improved over time in various different uh, scenarios of their test cases. So it shows how the things are improving. Um, there's a few references there, I think, into the kernel and BPF. So, at that point, I think I shall say thank you for attending. Um, a little bit disappointed in the fact that this was a bit rushed. I'd have liked to have been able to have some more time to finish off the examples, go into some more interesting dive into the kernel. But I think you can see there's a lot lot of content that would end up having been left in the supporting notes. Um, I think we have a few minutes, I think we've got about four or five minutes left if anybody has any questions. So um, I have this lovely microphone. Is this yeah. it's a long walk for a short question. Um, I was just wondering if you considered using anything like a real-time peripheral, like an audio source or sync or anything like that to try and interrupt the scheduler? Yeah, I mean, that's one of the things that we've discussed internally. Um, it is a very good point that you could probably both measure uh, real-time response by inputting but you could also then have something trigger on an interrupt or external event. Um, again, this is one of those sort of um, side quests that I was very interested in doing, but again, there is a lot, so much work here that even with doing it as a full-time job, I mean, just to put an idea into the timescales, we've been working on, we had about one or two engineers on this since about February doing all sorts of work around real-time scheduling, measuring our own performances, so uh, measuring performances for ourselves 
and other, like how do we do that? Interruptions, test suites, and yeah, it's on our list of things to do to make some hardware. So maybe USB or with some of the ARM dev boards, GPIO interrupts, even sending those sort of things either into non-maskable interrupt, which are absolutely a pain, or into some sort of system management because again, you have a you may have a hypervisor or a system monitor above you and those things are extremely difficult to deal with when you're trying to do real time because they can steal time without you even being able to do anything about it. So, yeah, it's one of those management phrases, but it's a very good idea. Having some sort of external peripheral or known bad peripheral. So, uh, anybody else? We've got a couple of minutes left. Right, um, well, thank you. Uh, I hope this has been at least a starting point to people to think about. I think hopefully I will be giving this again at OSS Tokyo if anybody fancies a trip to Japan. Um, hopefully by then I've actually done a little bit more on this. So um, updated supporting materials and everything. Uh, and if anybody has any suggestions or wants to make a contribution once I've got the GitHub instance going, you're welcome. Oh, yeah, that is definitely the end of my slides. Right, thank you very much.